fine. Good start. So, yeah, thank you very much. It's been wonderful to come to Aspatar. And uh, thank you very much to everybody who's looked after me so well. It's great to see so many people here this morning as well. So thank you, Matt, for the, for the introduction. So my brief was to talk about um, some new advances on the effects of exercise training, environmental stress, and nutrition on immune function. So quite a, a broad brief, if you will. Um, just to show you where, where I'm based in the UK, I'm based at Bangor University, just here overlooking the beautiful Menai Straits. Um, we have this uh, wonderful building here, a beautiful listed building, looks right out over the Menai Straits. Um, it was renovated by the university in 1999, I arrived in 2000. Everybody would selected their offices here, looking out over the Menai Straits and the sailing boats. Unfortunately, my office is around the corner overlooking the car park, but it's still really nice. It's a wonderful place in the mountains with the sea. You must come and visit us uh, sometime. So, a little overview of the kind of structure of what I'm going to talk about today. So, I'm going to give you a history and a progress of this emerging subdiscipline of exercise physiology called exercise immunology. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how stress um, alters upper respiratory um, tract infection. So, URTI or URI typically for upper respiratory tract infection or upper respiratory illness when you see that abbreviation. I'll look at the specific effects of exercise, that's acute exercise and infection, and training status and infection too. I'll, I'll give you a whistle-stop tour of the effects of acute exercise and training on immune function. Is an increase in infection incidence in athletes due to suppressed immunity or to something else? I'll, I'll then talk to you about our work and others' work on environmental stress. Does exercising with uh, heat stress or cold stress present a double threat to the immune system? And then I'll finish up on nutrition. Is there anything we can do about this from a countermeasures point of view? So this is where it all started, really. I, I think it's fair to say that the immunologist um, Thomas Tomasi was the one who really... Um, started an interest in exercise immunology and performed that really good evidence-based science and practice that, you, that Matt spoke about there and Paul before. So what um, Thomas did in the very early 80s was he took an interest in infection incidents in elite athletes. In this case, they were cross-country skiers. And he approached this by collecting parotid saliva, which is not that easy to do using a Stenson cap on at the rear of the mouth to collect saliva coming from the parotid gland. He did this in some normal healthy controls and he did it in some cross-country skiers before they did a race, a hard race, a 50-kilometer race. And then he did it after the race. And what surprised him was there was two main findings. One was the effects of training status appears to actually at rest lower the IgA level in saliva. And we know that this important immunoglobulin in saliva protects you from upper respiratory tract infections. It's often at the oral tract, nasal and, and ocular too, where you first meet these, these pathogens that can make you sick with, for example, the common cold. So he showed some difference at baseline before they exercised that suggested a suppressed immune system or at least mucosal immune suppression. After the race, they then saw almost a 50-odd percent reduction in mucosal immunity from a lower uh, starting point. So I think I'd, I'd quite happily suggest that Thomas Tomasi was the one that started all this interest. And since that time, on saliva IJ and exercise alone, there have been more than 200 papers just on that one small topic of exercise immunology. And this is the kind of path that exercise immunology has taken in terms of publication output since that time. Uh, Tomasi's paper would appear down here in 1982. There was a, hardly any publications. Then uh, the Society of Exercise Immunology was formed in 1989. And then, bang, you get this huge exponential increase in the interest and number of publications on exercise and immunity. And here we are um, at the end of 2014. I've not put 15 data on because we're not at the end of the year yet. You can see that, that typically there are about 250 papers a year on this discipline. And depending on how you search it, almost 3,000 papers on exercise and immunity. A real um, 
buzzing uh, area of fruitful investigation. Immunologists, stress immunologists, have known about the effects of stress on immune function for much longer than we've known about the effects of exercise on immune function. Probably the world's leader on this, one of the ISI most highly cited scientists, is Sheldon Cohen from Carnegie Mellon in the United States. And Sheldon's done some of the most fantastic, hence the, the journal, most fantastic and well-cited work on stress and immune function in daily life. He's done work, I'd probably call it obvious science, albeit brilliant, on marital conflict and, and lack of support by your wife or your husband. Anybody who's, who's married will certainly know that that can cause you a stress and improve, increase your infection incidence for sure. And he's published some very, very well-cited papers on that. This is one beautiful paper. It's obvious science, but it's so well done. That's why it's in New England Journal. So what he's done is he's categorized people as low stress to very high stress people. And then what he's done in a good population, about 400 subjects, is he's inoculated them with live respiratory pathogens, one of five that cause the common cold, such as the rhinovirus and the coronavirus. So he sprayed this into the nasal passages, and then he sees who develops the actual symptoms in the following days. Beautiful design. You can't get the IRB or the ethical permission to do much of this type of work anymore. Sheldon told me that quite upset when he told me that that's the case. And of course, you show this obvious but dose-response linear relationship. The greater the stress status, the lower the immune competence, increased incidence of the common cold. So my first practical recommendation there with your athletes is to consider monitoring life stress. And you can do that a number of ways. There are a number of very simple daily questionnaires or phone apps uh, adaptable that you can use. And there's also good evidence that progressive muscular relaxation, other psychological skills training programs to reduce stress actually can improve, for example, vaccination responses. So something you should consider as a recommendation on the back of Sheldon's work there. He's also done some other work published in very good clinical journals on the importance of good sleep efficiency. So what I've done here is use my very simple traffic light approach. I apologize for the simple way I break this down. Here is the percentage of common colds suffered, and he's used a good-sized population. He's used his standard respiratory challenge spray uh, into the nasal passage. So what you have here is individuals... Um, Like my wife who puts her head on the pillow and she goes straight to sleep every night. So greater than 98% of the time she's in bed, she's asleep, even if I'm still talking to her when we've gone to bed. And then here are the people who spend, you know, a few percent of the night awake. They're not such good sleepers. Here are the bad sleepers. They're not very good sleepers at all. They spend um, less than 85% of the time in bed asleep poor sleep efficiency. And of course, as you'd expect, logic tells you, good science says you're right, that actually poor sleep, poor immune status. And there's actually good evidence, um, I know from the English Institute of Sport, of poor sleep quality in actually UK international athletes of about this level in, in cases. So another recommendation is consider monitoring sleep. It's very easy to do this now with free phone apps and so on. Um, How we improve sleep is another conversation. Um, But some simple practical guidelines. Is upper respiratory infection or any infection really important for athletes? The answer, at least from the UK um, data, is yes. This was a survey performed by these groups um, uh, ahead of uh, London 2012. They asked 30 sports, uh, summer and winter sports, um, the medical teams to comment on the the biggest problems for their athletes. And of course, joint injury was the one that they said was the biggest problem. But actually, if you add together respiratory infection and miscellaneous type infections, the second biggest problem cited by the medical practitioners was actually infection. And we've had some conversations over the last few days here that suggest that this is probably underreporting of infection and the impact of infection. So the first really good evidence base in in exercise immunology now uh, on infection incidents in athletes, really we we can look to um, David Neiman at North Carolina in the US to provide some really good evidence on this in the early 90s. 
He looked at the uh, Los Angeles 1987 marathon. And this is what a marathon runner looked like in 1987. And uh, he showed that, that good club runners who were running about 60 miles a week, that is, were getting twice as many uh, self-reports of common colds as individuals like me, who a Joe jogger, jogging about 18, 20 miles a week, not very fast. So he, he seemed to suggest that people who are good club run runners running quite a lot each week seem to pick up more upper respiratory tract infection symptoms using these daily health logs. There are criticisms to those, of course, but we now know that even just having symptoms without even a true infection, symptoms of the upper respiratory tract um, infections, actually those symptoms can impair performance. He developed this J-shaped curve that I'm sure many of you have seen, um, where he's showing the risk of common cold or upper respiratory tract infection here and the dose of exercise here. And there's some quite good evidence now that moderate exercise each day that is short lasting actually improves your host defense and reduces opportunistic infection incidents. But that if, like your athletes, they're engaged in very hard, prolonged exercise, they actually suffer more colds. Uh, Krista Malm has challenged this a number of times, uh, a very good scientist from Sweden, and he's actually suggesting, and there is some evidence to support this, that there's almost an S-shaped curve in the elite athletes who get to the very, very top. They seem to have some robustness that means they don't pick up the common cold as well as the slightly lower standard athletes. And I have some more evidence to support that in just a moment. So, to summarize the first bit, is it a case that this chap who's really brisk walking the marathon with a smile on his face, he, he's not particularly skinny and suffering from mal malnutrition. He's probably also getting good vitamin D from the sunlight exposure. Um, but he's happy, he's fit for life with improved immune status maybe and reduced infection incidence. But these guys here who are probably running twice as fast as the happy chap on the left are they fit to drop with depressed immune function and increased infection incidence? So let's challenge that now. So this is some very recent work, an excellent paper in medicine and science and sport and exercise just this summer by David Pine and the group at INSEP in Paris. They worked with some uh, elite um, high level uh, French swimmers over a four year period. And what I've done is given you the highlights in this table here of the risk of common cold. And the key factors appear to be some of which are quite obvious, but we often forget. In the winter, there's almost three times the risk of common cold, as you'd expect, um, than the summer. So winter's an important focus for hygiene and so on, as we'll talk later to prevent the common cold. What they showed that was much more insightful and less obvious was about a 40% increased risk of common cold in the very good swimmers who were national, but compared with those that were top international, which supports Krista Malm's, Krista Malm's suggestion that there's an S-shaped curve with infection risk uh, uh, and exercise dose. The high-level athletes have less of a risk compared to those who are not quite there. If you've had symptoms of common cold in the previous week, also that's a big red flag. When you're increasing training load, has a 10% increase in cold risk, whether that's the overall load or even strength type conditioning work. So resistance work also has an impact on the incidence of the cold. The moderate training phases reduced infection incidence compared to the most intense training phases, which again seems quite obvious. But what is really interesting is that the taper phase, when they're training very, very hard, but not so much training in terms of quantity, has a massive beneficial effect on reducing infection incidence. And to the contrary to a lot of previous work, um, suggesting that competition was very stressful and increased infection, actually they didn't show that that was a major concern. So the simple recommendations here from this paper are that we need to take specific care and precaution during the winter in our national rather than very elite level athletes. Um, when there's recent symptoms of infection in the previous week, 
during very, very high load training, as you might expect, and when you are increasing the training load. That's when the red flags should be waving um, for you. So some simple practical, practical recommendations that probably should be the first recommendation, really, is so simple to do these things. But I think we need to remind our coaching staff and athletes about self-inoculation. Don't be rubbing the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. Uh, avoid that at all times. Avoid the, the, the dirty weight training equipment and so on. Without, you must clean it. Uh, the, the danger zones, if you like, or door handles we've spoken about over the last few days. And obviously think very carefully about hand hygiene. Simple, very practical recommendations. Recommendation four. And the fifth recommendation, I won't dwell on for a long time here, is to make sure your athletes have the annual influenza vaccination and also, just as a slight aside, take particular precaution to ensure your training staff and athletes are protected for hepatitis B. So a, a, a biological model for why we might expect stress to affect immune function. So... We have a number of uh, stresses we're going to talk about ever so briefly today. Exercise, obviously, is one. Nutrition is another. I'll briefly touch later on environmental stress as well. And typically, the body meets those stresses with a coordinated series of events, starting up here, ending up down here, that regulate or are known to modulate immune function. You've obviously the neuroendocrine axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or the HPA, which, of course, stimulates the cortex, the adrenal cortex, to release glucocorticoids that we know to be immunosuppressive, such as cortisol, that we're all well aware of. There's also down the left side here, the sympathetic adrenal medullary axis, which, of course, gives rise to increased circulating levels of the catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Again, we know there are beta receptors to epinephrine, for example, on immune cells. So we know very, very well from tens and tens of years that um, short-term stress, for example, that makes you excited, the fear, flight, fright response, actually increases catecholamines, and those can modulate immune function. But we sometimes forget that there's a direct effect of temperature, for example, in the blood on immune cell function too, when you are hot or the opposite as well when you are cold. So how does acute exercise and training affect the different arms of the immune system, if I can be so crude as to separate them into two simple arms? The first being the innate, the second being the acquired. I appreciate it's quite a crude uh, separation. So we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time looking at the effects on the first line of defense due to exercise on the skin, the oral tract, and the ocular surface has been a particular uh, interest of ours recently, the respiratory and the GI tract too. Our second line of defense is, of course, where we really bring in the immune cells here, and we're talking about inflammation and fever and cordoning off the site of an immune challenge. Here we have key players in the phagocytic cells, the neutrophil and the monocyte. I describe them to my students as Pac-Man, engulfing particles that they believe to be uh, foreign. They're not very specific in their job of doing that, as we'll see. But that's the innate immune system. And how is the, and this is just showing you a little video of how those immune cells migrate out of the blood down a chemoattractic gradient. This is a splinter um, uh, out in the tissues. It could also be damaged muscle. And of course, we know when you damage your muscles through eccentric muscle actions, the swelling in the muscles and the pain is mostly due to the immune cells that are going in there and causing that swelling and doing the clear up operation. The second line of defense here. So how does acute exercise affect this innate arm of the immune system? This is some work we did in the lab in Birmingham in the late 90s now under Mike Gleason's um, tutelage. We looked at neutrophil function, these innate immune cells. We looked at the neutrophil's ability to gobble up some bacteria before and after exercise and to release a digestive enzyme called elastase. We did that before and after hard exercise, 80% of max, that was to fatigue, which lasted this long, and much more moderate intensity exercise, but that was much longer lasting. And we saw suppressive effects, um, albeit 
relatively short term suppressive effects on both of these um, exercise bouts. But we saw that there was a greater reduction in neutrophil function after the more prolonged, but albeit lighter intensity exercise. And this fitted with what people were starting to call the open window theory, whereby in the hours after exercise, you are more prone to these opportunistic infections. So what about acquired immune function? So here we're dealing with humoral or antibody immunity and cell-mediated targeted um, killing by lymphocytes and natural killer cells predominantly. Here's our guy who organizes everybody. He's the master of ceremonies, the T helper lymphocyte. He shouts out to his mates, the Robin Hood with his, his bow and arrow and his, his antibodies. Here's our B lymphocyte. And then we have our cytotoxic T cell super sharp shooter. Um, if he could speak, he would say that the neutrophils and the monocytes of the innate immune system are just rubbish. And I'm a sharpshooter. I know what I'm killing and I kill it when I'm told to. Not just any old thing that I think is foreign. And this just shows you that the innate immune system in grey, shown as a, a macrophage, which is a monocyte that goes and takes up residence in the tissue, they actually don't work in separation as I'm trying to present them for simplicity. They all work together. Here's your bacteria. It meets the pre antigen presenting cell, part of the innate immune system. It talks to the acquired immune system and you get these antibodies that help agglutinate and stop the bacteria swimming and help the immune system kill it. How does exercise affect that aspect of immunity? So David Neiman's work again, here we have some of these T lymphocytes attacking, attacking a nasty in this case, I think it's a tumor cell. And you can see that after exercise using a lymphocyte proliferation assay, this is um, exercise at a moderate intensity and a hard intensity same duration now. And you can see that the hard exercise, the high level intensity exercise, has a greater suppressive effect on immune function. But the better design in this study is that they actually matched the exercise duration, which we didn't do a very good job of in our previous study, I have to admit. So both the innate and the acquired arms of the immune system are temporarily suppressed after an acute bout of heavy exercise. And something that's troubled us for many years since, and I was lucky enough to lead this position statement in Exercise Immunology Review with 20-odd of the world's leaders on this topic. Here is one of them, Monica Fleschner from Boulder in, in Colorado, who drew this really simple but really nice um, uh, schematic, if you, if you like, showing, well, we don't quite know how clinically relevant some of these immune changes are in our athletes and soldiers. Here you have, I've colored it green because I like traffic lights, you, you have your optimal immune status. We're mostly interested in going down, but it's important, particularly uh, amongst the doctors in the room, I'm sure you can tell me more about this than I know, that actually sometimes the immune system overreacts and, and you get an elevation in immune activity, dysregulated and uncontrolled at times, which of course could, could cause allergy, hypersensitivity uh, and the destruction, for example, of joints by predominantly the innate immune system in rheumatoid arthritis and so on. We're not typically that concerned about this with exercise and heavy training. Mostly we're worried about a reduction in immune function. And it may well be that some of our athletes are in this zone here, some of the time when they've been training hard, that they're actually suffering from 10, 20, 25 percent reductions in their immune status after exercise. And any further reductions in immune status can put them in the red zone where they certainly have compromised immune function. We know, for example, that HIV patients typically need to lose about 50% of their T lymphocyte CD4, CD8 cells for them to pick up opportunistic infections. Most of what we show with heavy training isn't 50, 60% reductions in their immune cell function. Sometimes, yes. Mostly it's 10, 20, 25% reductions. So we're still being challenged with whether they're clinically really relevant. So what we really are trying to get our community to do is to use in vivo immune tests, not just measuring blood T cell function or blood neutrophil or natural killer cell function, actually challenge the immune system, just like the very best study that I showed you right at the beginning on psychological stress did. Sheldon Cohen with his respiratory uh, inoculation up the nasal passage. The problem with that is you won't get athletes to do that. You can't get the IRB or the ethical permission anyway. So we have to do the next best thing to look at in vivo immunity. 
And so what we've done here in this recent paper in MedSci is we've used a skin patch test. Easy to apply to the skin. You don't have to inject these antigens um, under the skin. Stick on the skin this patch. In this case, it contains an allergen called diphencyprone that stimulates a T-cell memory. It develops T-cell memory. You've never experienced this chemical, this antigen, ever before in your lives. It's manufactured. And then they develop memory to that. And then a month later, what we do is we look at the dermal thickening at the skin. This is about one millimeter deep using an ultrasound, the, the, the dermis. This is after application, a doubling of the depth here from one mil here to over two at a site on the skin, a tiny patch where there's diphencyprone. So what we can do is we can stress people different ways before we first expose them to diphencyprone on this skin patch. And then a month later, we look at the strength of the memory recall. And what surprised us here, and has changed the way we think about exercise, uh, changed the way we think about types of exercise and how they suppress immune fu function or not. What we did was we had one group of subjects rest in our lab. We had another group of subjects perform 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. We had another group perform 30 minutes of very hard exercise at 80 percent of max, just like the exercise that David Neiman had showed to reduce lymphocyte proliferation. And then we had about two hours long of very moderate exercise. We'd used it many times in studies, only 60 percent max. We could be jogging along together at 60 percent max and I could be having a good conversation with you. And we were surprised to see that the dermal thickening in response to the memory challenge to diphencyprone was much suppressed, over 50% in those individuals that had done the light exercise, but it was very prolonged. It was two hours. But that 30 minutes of really hard exercise didn't significantly suppress immune function. And so one of our recommendations, which fits with David Pine's recommendations in the swimmer study you saw earlier on, is we should consider replacing some of the long duration, moderate intensity training with shorter spike sessions that are really high quality, particularly if we want to protect the immune system. Okay. How else can we do clinical work with our athletes that's relevant, that can predict true infection. Well, another way we can do this is by looking at mucosal immunity, which we know relates well with infection. This is some work from Mike Gleason's group at Loughborough University in the UK. They did this with elite sailors. Uh, uh, some of them you can see here. They did this study, if I remember rightly, over a whole year where they collected weekly saliva samples. Very easy to do with athletes in the field. Hence, it's a very attractive way of monitoring immunity. And they've looked at the change in saliva IgA as a percent. Here's the 100 percent line. Sorry if it's not come out so well. And here is the upper respiratory tract infection in, an athlete, in the athletes. So they've looked, they've gone backwards and looked at the weeks before the common cold and see, well, for these individual sailors, do you see a reduction? And the answer is yes. They seem to see a progressive reduction in mucosal immunity that has some predictive power for the common cold. There are challenges to this that we can discuss separately, but it's what it is, essentially, which is that there seems to be a reduction in mucosal immunity in the weeks prior to the onset of the common, common cold. Does it work for monitoring? Possibly. Possibly. So on my whistle-stop tour, I'll talk now about heat. And of course, we're very interested in heat stress. A lot of my work is with these groups at the top here. The, the military recruit, actually. Some work with the actual soldier, but mostly with the army recruit. And we have specific challenges in the desert, of course, but also particularly with the types of clothing, nuclear, biological, chemical, uh, warfare type clothing, which is of particular interest uh, recently. Uh, and of course, there are other occupations that are important. And these athletes who, have, who perform in extreme heats as well. It was Roy Shepard, who's written almost a thousand papers now in sports medicine. And I think most of us have probably read something by R.J. Shepard at some point. He also had a massive impact on the field of exercise immunology as well. And it was Roy that first suggested, not us in this review article here, Roy that first suggested, well, if you're exercising in temperate conditions, this we know can suppress your immune function. I've given you a dissertation on that. What about if you add heat into the mix? Is this a double threat to the immune system? 
He had a cadre of wonderful scientists in Toronto at the Defence and Civil Institute. They were very interested, like we are, in military personnel and athletes, but military predominantly. And with Sean Ryan, they did some really elegant studies, the lovely studies, where they had a monarch cycle ergometer, and they took the cradle off and put some sort of uh, fans, if you like, um, fins, if you like, on the flywheel, bolted it to the bottom of a water tank, and had the individuals exercise immersed up to the neck in, on one occasion, warm water with a rise in core temperature. And on another occasion, hence I've coloured it blue, they clamped core temperature by having individuals exercise in 18 degree water. Really cool, because what you can do, sorry about the pun there, what you can do is you can, you can look at the slightly mechanistic, but the independent effects of exercise, aside from this rising core temperature. How much of the immune perturbation is due to just getting hot? What they showed, which you might expect, is that the increases in epinephrine or adrenaline in circulation were much bigger when you have a rising core temperature. Same for noradrenaline and pretty much the same for cortisol. So they've essentially blunted these catecholamines. What happens then when you when you, when you blunt that, what happens to the immune cell counts? Well, what happens is they showed almost a 50% blunting in the leukocytosis, the increase in cell counts in the blood, by blunting core temperature. So Roy's team was suggesting that actually part of the changes we see in immune cell counts and function after exercise are just due to the actual temperature. So then it might make sense if you get hotter, you have greater changes in immune function. So they did a series of studies. Here's another one where they looked at lymphocyte proliferation here. We might term this cell-mediated acquired immunity. And then on this side, we're looking at humoral immunity, antibody production. Okay. What they did was two bouts of exercise um, in hot, in red, and temperate, in yellow conditions. And they were separated by resting conditions. And this is one of the only papers, actually, that shows a significant, albeit small, suppression in T-cell mediated immunity by doing the same exercise, but in hotter conditions versus temperate conditions. But interestingly, if you look at antibody production, humoral immunity, actually, it goes the other way. You actually see significant effects whereby exercising in the heat across two bouts of exercise actually gives us greater levels of pokeweed mitogen stimulated IgM levels in, in, in circulation. So when we've written a, a number of reviews on this, we've actually said there isn't a huge amount of support for a greater threat when you exercise in the heat to immune function. And that's mostly because uh, exercise is typically self-limiting when you exercise in the heat. You stop earlier. You reach that end point of exercise, physiological fatigue, if you like, however you want to describe it, sooner, or you exercise at a lower relative exercise intensity. So the effects on immune function are then controlled accordingly by your control over the exercise intensity and duration. We've done some recent work looking at inflammation and, and its role in altering core temperature and hence risks of heat illness. We did one study here in MedSci, Sport and Exercise, a couple of years ago now, looking at the effects of running downhill versus running on almost a flat treadmill on subsequent heat strain during exercise in hot conditions that took place 30 minutes later. And what we show here is, here is our control group who 30 minutes later have just done a bout of exercise on, you know, 1% gradient, a relatively flat and this is the group in orange who 30 minutes earlier, before going into the heat, have not damaged their muscles. So, sorry, have damaged their muscles. They've run downhill on a minus 10% gradient. So they've got a little bit of inflammation from running downhill. Does this impact through release of pyrogenic cytokines and so on, IL-1, beta, IL-6 and so on? We know those are pyrogenic cytokines that alter the set point for temperature. Does this impact firmer regulation? And the answer was yes, running downhill, when you then go ex and exercise in the heat, causes some half a degree increase in core temperature. And what we did here was we looked at the relationship between the rise in core temperature that was greater after damaging exercise and the circulating IL-6 
this one of the uh, cytokines that we know, the inflammatory cytokines that we know can increase core temperature. And we did show a reasonably strong correlation between the change in plasma IL-6 before and after the muscle damaging bout and the subsequent change in core temperature when they exercised in the heat. And there are many researchers in the world that believe that inflammation due to exercise and heavy training can impact upon thermoregulation in athletes and soldiers in the heat. So what we then did was we, we used Priscilla Clarkson's repeated bout effect. So we know we can protect people from muscle damage by doing it once before. If you damage yourselves by doing a step class today up and down here or running downhill, uh, you'll be very sore in the following days if you're unaccustomed. If you do that two weeks later, you won't get the inflammation, the immune fl cells flowing into the muscle, the tenderness, and so on in the inflammation. So what we see is our increased core temperature response to exercise in the heat compared with our control group at bout one that we'd shown uh, in a publication I'd just shown you. But then the next time... Uh, EIMD2, which was two weeks later, the rise in core temperature in each of these individuals was almost the same as the control group, absolutely almost identical. So one of our following recommendations there is it might hurt a little bit, but it certainly wouldn't hurt at all to include muscle damage in your training if your athletes are going to perform in the heat because it will blunt this inflammatory response and likely then, as you can see here, blunt the rise in core temperature and potentially the risk of heat illness. And we've got a great interest now in, in, in the effects of passive heat exposure on immunity and thermal strain as well. Um, the Scandinavians have believed for many, many years that sauna has great benefits to prevent the common cold. And there's good work in cancer patients on hot water immersion to improve uh, the outcomes in these patients. And of course, it was the Romans that were there a few thousand years ago who knew about the potential benefits of, of hot water bathing. And it was Sylvia Plath who said, I'm sure there are things that can't be cured by a good bath, but right now I can't think of one. Um, so we've got more work on that right now. I'm going to speed to looking at cold exposure for the purposes of time. We, we know that the common cold is common at a time of the year when temperature, particularly this is uh, North America, is low in the winter months, the common cold peaks. Is that due to temperature? It's called the common cold after all. Well, Ron Eccles in Cardiff, uh, the common cold unit in Cardiff, has done some really wacky work on the old wives' tale. Your, your mum probably told you, she told me, um, you know, don't get your hair wet. It's quite funny now looking at me. Um, don't get your hair wet after swimming. Dry your hair. Don't get your extremities cold because you'll catch a chill. Is there any sense in that? Does it make sense? Immunologically, it actually does make sense not to get the periphery cold. And what Ron has done here is he's had people put their feet in cold water for 20 minutes and very simply monitored cold symptoms in the following days. He's done some other well-controlled studies too on this. And he showed that in the following days, people who put their feet in cold water for 20 minutes had a much greater incidence of cold symptoms than those who were in his control group. And he's a firm believer that actually most of the winter when it's really cold in Northern Europe, for example, our nose is exposed. So the immune cell function inside here, which is, of course, very, very important inside here in the nasal cavity, actually is suppressed. Very simple, logical, sounds a bit wacky, but he's done good work on that hypothesis. So another recommendation is we should avoid getting cold and wet because this can certainly increase the symptoms of the common cold. I think the summary on cold before we, we, we just move to altitude and then I can finish up on nutrition is that we... People believe getting cold and wet suppresses the immune system. And actually, we know that if you do get pretty cold, your core temperature drops by at least one degree. Yes, we and others have shown that immune function is suppressed for sure. But mild cooling, low drops in rectal temperature of only half a degree, actually can stimulate the immune system. What I think we know very little about is the very common practice in athletes right now of cryotherapy to apparently improve recovery from exercise, whether this is good for the immune system or not so good. Ron Eccles, I think, would say it's not good for the immune system. You should not get your, your periphery, for example, cold. But we don't know the answer to that one. There are a good number of studies on altitude exposure and immunity now. Here is just one. Um, what we have shown and others have shown 
which is the quite common finding that T-cell mediated immunity is actually suppressed when you train at high altitude or you reside at high altitude. Here we had individuals passively reside up at altitude for uh, a day or two at 3,800 meters. They ascended up on a cable car, so no exercise. We then sensitized them with our skin patch. And a month later, we did the recalls and we saw that the thickening of the dermis was much lower than our control group. And the reddening at these sites where we put our challenge to the skin was also lower. And this fits with the work on whole blood T cell um, proliferation that others have done that shows that altitude exposure reduces T cell mediated immunity, but not humoral immunity. And so that's the consensus on altitude. But we don't really have any countermeasures right now to recommend to you. Is it that you need to consume carbohydrate, for example, while you're at altitude? Are there supplements that can help? So I'll just finish up on, on some highlights from the diet. I was given a big brief, so you have to bear with me trying to rattle through probably 30, 40 years worth of research on this. And, and so I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, which is extremely simple, which we know that diet can affect um, immune status directly by limiting the availability of, of nutrients, coenzymes, cofactors for these immune cell functions. But we also know that if you exercise, say you've been fasting, making weight for competition, for example, when you exercise uh, under uh, restricted nutrient intake, you do get increases, for example, in the uh, uh, hormones that we know modulate the immune function, such as cortisol. You get greater increases in cortisol and circulation after you have exercised in a fasted state, for example. Does this increase infections in athletes? There's some reasonable evidence to suggest that, yes, it does. So we did some studies with the military in the mid, mid noughties if you like. This is Sam Oliver, who's one of my team now, showing that fluid restriction over two days, this is two-day period, energy restriction over two days. This is, they received about 200 milliliters of water to survive on a day. Here they had only 10% of their daily rations as food. This is the combined trial. We have significant almost additive effects, reductive effects on saliva IgA. So short term, a couple of days of fluid and energy restriction, like a making weight scenario, reduces mucosal immunity. So there's a clear, obvious recommendation there. Wherever possible, avoid these fluid and energy deficits because they transiently suppress immune function. We've also done a series of other studies I've talked about during my stay here, showing that hydration has impacts on outputs of, for example, saliva and tear fluid, which will have an impact negatively on the uh, well, dehydration, on the output of important saliva antimicrobial proteins. So we recommend monitoring hydration status either with daily nude body mass or you can use simple urine measures. Carbohydrates, one we spent some time on in the 90s. We showed that a regular sports drink during exercise, albeit here about a litre per hour, so quite a lot of sports drink, can blunt the typical circulating cortisol response. Here's your carbohydrate trial. So we might expect that that would prevent some of the reductions in immune function. And there are lots of papers that show that that is actually the case. If you consume carbohydrate during exercise... Here, as Letty Bishop has shown at Loughborough, two hours of exercise, regular carbohydrate sports drinks, you can blunt the impairment in the ability of T lymphocytes to chase a very important challenge for us, the rhinovirus that we know causes often the common cold. So carbohydrate during exercise can certainly blunt some of these immune changes. So two brief recommendations there. We know that a high carbohydrate diet and carbohydrate ingestion during exercise about that much. 50 grams an hour, can certainly blunt the stress hormones and therefore blunt the immune uh, suppression. If your athletes are training low with low carbohydrate, then we think that the timing of feeding after exercise is crucial, soon as possible. But there's then, of course, a carbohydrate paradox. We know that training with low carbohydrate can be good for cellular adaptations. But we are telling the community of sports science that actually we know this is bad for immune status. So there's a kind of rub there. You need to balance when you train low on carbohydrate and when you might want to have high levels of carbohydrate for performance, but also for immunity. And finishing up here uh, on the um, vitamins and zinc and, and, and uh, vitamin D, I've gathered the antioxidants 
together, A, C, any here. The evidence is about two star out of five stars. It's okay, but it's not brilliant in terms of if you take these supplements daily, will they prevent the common cold? They're not very good at preventing the common cold, but they might reduce the symptoms of the cold when you've actually got some symptoms. There are very good Cochrane reports, as I will show you on these in just a second. And the 13th recommendation there is certainly consider a multivitamin uh, supplement daily in your athletes if they're making weight for competition and, and, and they've got uh, energy restriction. This is a, a recent Cochrane review on the common cold incidence with daily vitamin, D, vitamin C sorry, supplementation of uh, an amount daily that we know would saturate the body's tissues. What Harry Hemmler and the team um, agreed on here was that the evidence was very strong. There's over 11,000 subjects in some 29 studies, but very small, if any, effect of vitamin C preventing the common cold. But compelling evidence that if you take vitamin C, the actual duration of a common cold is much reduced. The evidence is strong and the quality is strong on that. But unfortunately, there are only five studies on athletes and soldiers. Even though those studies show a quite a large reduction in the incidence of the common cold, about 50%, which is compelling, we need more studies that are strong, not weak. So I think that the, the recommendation on vitamin C here is that you should certainly consider a vitamin C supplement once you have symptoms of the common cold. For zinc, similar story. It's a wonderful Cochrane review by Singh and, and his colleagues. Um, there are not good uh, num studies in terms of number and quality on prevention. Only two, unfortunately. But what they show is that regular zinc consumption, typically of around 75 milligrams per day um, in a lozenge, for example, can um, actually reduce the number of people when they have a common cold who are still suffering the common cold seven days after the start. So there's some quite good advice that you could consume a lozenge, for example, um, uh, with 75 milligrams of zinc acetate uh, during the common cold to reduce symptoms. But we know there are some problems with some side effects in terms of horrible taste in the mouth and nausea, which you have to contend with. But that's another recommendation there that zinc would be worth supplementing once you have the common cold. And I'll just look very quickly at vitamin D so we get some time for questions. We know it was Hope Simpson, the epidemiologist in the United Kingdom, that was first to make the observation that the common cold is very common at times of year when UVB light is quite low or absent in the northern uh, hemisphere in high latitudes. Um, we've always thought that it was temperature, hence it's called the common cold. His hypothesis was actually it was just UVB light and hence vitamin D formation at the skin or lack thereof during the winter that could relate to suppressed immunity and why the common cold is so common in these periods in the northern hemisphere, in this case in British adults. And there's one good study here from the group at Loughborough that shows what they've done is they've categorized athletes into what they call optimal levels of circulating vitamin D. And those that I think the Institute of Medicine, uh, most people agree, would be deficient for vitamin D. And what they show is that there's a greater incidence of um, common cold in those that are deficient for vitamin D, those athletes that are deficient during the winter, than those who are optimal. They had fewer numbers of common cold days if they were optimal for um, vitamin D. And they also had better saliva IgA status than those who were deficient, these, these athletes. So we certainly recommend a vitamin D supplement during the winter time, uh, northerly latitudes of about 1,000 IUs a day uh, sort of from October onwards to March to um, pre prevent uh, infections where possible. So here's my last slide. So I think there's some obvious recommendations here to maintain uh, immunity. Uh, just so we can finish up there, I think the idea is balanced diet, match the energy intake with requirements, and then you, you won't really necessarily need supplements to actually prevent infections. But there's some good evidence that these supplements work if your individuals are immune compromised and also to reduce symptoms when they have a common cold. Thank you.